Today we're going to be talking about privileged microaggressions and how do we have tough conversations, right? Um, I heard the charge in our last uh, talk and kind of going through some of the efforts that you're doing of like moving from the information phase of things into the action side of things, right? I'm going to start off telling you a little bit about myself. Um, Parker McMullen Bushman, my pronouns are she, they. Um, I do have, I got my start in kind of the environmental education um, realm, and now I work with a lot of different types of organizations. Um, I like to say instead of I wear a number of different hats, that I wear a number of different head wraps. So I am the COO of Inclusive Guide. Inclusive Guide is a tech startup um, where we, we kind of call it like Yelp but for inclusion. So people rate businesses and spaces on how they feel like they were treated in relation to their identity when they're in that space. And then we provide uh, those organizations with detailed feedback on um, which groups they're serving really well and which groups maybe you know they might need some help on. And so people rate places on if they felt safe and that's emotional, mental, and physical safety, if they felt welcomed, were they treated with dignity like everyone else, and did they feel celebrated? Did they feel like their identity was represented in the space? And then businesses get rated on a one to five scale, and if you have like, let's say a 4.2, they can then look at details that say, all right, maybe we have, um, Asian men are consistently giving us a 4.8, but white women who use wheelchairs are giving us a 3.8, and this is why, right? They can see kind of the differences between the two. I'm also the CEO of Eco-Inclusive Strategies, which is an organization that works with nonprofits and conservation-based orgs um, around how do we move out of talking about things into action. I'm also the founder of Summit for Action, which is a yearly summit where we talk about that same thing. We get, uh, I'm from Denver, so we get uh, communities together in the Denver metro area, and they actually, at the end of our summit, they make commitments around whatever the topic is that we're talking about. Last year, we talked about environmental justice. Uh, this year, we're talking about public health. Um, in addition to that, I sit on a number of local and national boards, and uh, like Leah said, you can find me on social media under the uh, moniker Queen Work. <laughs> Queen actually stands for Keep Widening Environmental Engagement Narratives. And I did get my start in my career, my master's of science is in natural resources with a focus on environmental education. And, you know, I found in that space, as in a lot of other spaces, there was not equal representation, right? I was often the only uh, person of color or the only black women, especially in um, leadership space spaces and our education spaces. And so I started out my uh, work in inclusion really focused on representation and how do we have these conversations and queen work was kind of um, born out of that. So why are we here today? We are going to be talking about and raising awareness around the role of privilege in our lives. And that's kind of been a charged word, right? You talk about privilege and uh, people, you know, get that kind of little like butterfly in their stomach and they're like, what, what do you mean by privilege, right? We're going to talk a little bit about that and we're also going to talk about microaggressions and how as allies within spaces, we can disrupt things like microaggressions and in a way that calls people in, right, and helps to educate folks. 
So that's what we're going to be talking about today under this creating a culture of care. And there are so many things that we have to think about when we are talking about creating this culture, right? When we want to create a space where everyone feels like they belong, that their culture is represented, that they are treated uh, equally uh, to the people around them, right? There's lots of different things that go into that, whether it's uh, examining the ideologies of our organizations, whether it is talking about and recognizing oppression that might be baked into how our systems have been developed, talking about equity, stereotypes, privilege, and microaggressions. So, but first we have the conversation of how did we get here? And a lot of times, you know, if you go back 30 years, we were talking about diversity, right? And diversity almost only, we're like, okay, we have to have that representation. We know that when we go into certain spaces, we don't see everyone there. And so what we were really working toward was making sure that we had people in the space, but having people in the space didn't always mean that they were being included, right? So I like to start off by talking about what diversity is because we focus a lot on racial diversity and I'll be talking about that too, but there is so many different types of diversity outside of uh, racial diversity. Um, there's racial, there's ethnic, and if you don't know the difference between the two, right, we have large racial categories like white, black, Asian, so on and so forth. But within each of those categories, we have those ethnicities. So someone could be black, right? But they could be African-American or maybe they're Kenyan or they're from, you know, what your country is, is your ethnicity. Someone might be white, right? But their ethnicity is German or um, other things like that. We also have gender, age, regional differences. I travel all over the United States doing different talks and presentations and keynotes and it is different when you go into different areas of uh, the US and there's different uh, thoughts and culture there so your uh, culture can be affected by where you grew up your sexual orientation your abilities your disabilities but those things are just the tip of the iceberg we're often concentrating on what we perceive that we can tell from a person, the differences that we think we can tell what's above the water. But there's so much more that makes up who a person is. And even in a room that looks very much the same, right, there can be a lot of diversity there. But we are often taught to focus on the things that make us the same. We have not been taught and we're not as good at focusing on and celebrating the things that make us different. So in a room where everyone looks pretty similar, right, we might think that everyone's the same, but there's a lot of differences there. And when I'm working with organizations that where everyone looks similar, I tell them if you wanna get ready for the inclusion and the equity part, you need to learn about and celebrate the diversity that you already have so that when you bring in that uh, folks that are different, you are then prepared to also celebrate their diversity. We talk a lot about racial diversity because we know that racial diversity is changing our nation and changing it very quickly. In this year, 2023, more than half of all children, 18 and younger, will be minorities, right? So we are there and that diversity is growing. When we're talking about equity issues, we often also focus on race, but I don't think a lot of people understand why, why it is important to focus on the intersections of race and other uh, identities. Um, we, uh, people have probably heard the term intersectionality before, right? And what we have found is that where race intersects with other social issues that we're trying to solve, you often find the biggest pain point.
So if we are trying to solve for the issue that people with disabilities have the highest rate of unemployment in the United States, they are also the highest minority group, being about 25% of our population, right? We, we want to solve that problem. People with disabilities are unemployed at a higher rate than our general society. But if we look at that group, and we're not thinking about the intersections of race, we might solve a problem for white people with disabilities. And when you look at the group of people with disabilities, white people with disabilities actually have one of the highest rates of employment within that demographic. Black people with disabilities have the lowest rate of unemployment. So if you solve for white people with disabilities, you might end up creating a solution that doesn't also address the fact that the intersection of race and disability actually intersects to make um, that demographic more unemployed, right? So we have to think about intersections within our things and racial intersections with other things actually provide one of the biggest pain points. We also talk a lot about race because of those changes, and we know that in since before 1990, we've had a lot of changes in demographics within our country. In 1990, our non-Hispanic white demographic made up around 76% of our population. By the time we got to 2019, it was 60% of our population. Our fastest growing demographic is our Hispanic demographic, right? And Hispanic and uh, Latinx are not the same thing, right? Hispanic means Spanish speaking, and you might have people who are European and also Spanish speaking, so white presenting, but Spanish speaking. Um, Latinx is people of that, um, descent usually from the, the mix of Spanish-speaking Spaniards that came over and colonized um, down in Mexico, the indigenous tribes, and that mixture of uh, indigenous tribes with the Spanish-speaking um, Europeans brought together a lot of what we see in modern day Mexico uh, today. And so Latinx is that indigenous background as, as well. And so our fastest growing demographic is our Hispanic demographic. And by 2050, they're going to be 30% of our population while our non-Hispanic white demographic is going to go down to 46%. So our nation, we're looking at these changes and we're realizing, oh, this is big. And when we look around our organizations, we are not seeing that same representation as the world around us, as our country around us changes so rapidly. Inclusion, right, so that's diversity. Inclusion is a part that we were missing for a very long time in our DEI efforts, because we would bring people to the table, right, but we would not give them a voice. And inclusion means that we value people within an environment regardless of their differences. And that means we have to get past some of the biases that we have about the inherent worth of some people's opinions over others, of the way that some people show up in spaces over others, right? Uh, we've traditionally thought of our nation and a lot of our organizations more like a melting pot. And in a melting pot, everything comes together. You melt it down into one, you know, delicious flavored stew, right? We're like America, the melting pot. But really, people want to maintain their authenticity, maintain their culture and their history. They don't want to be melted down into one thing. And so we should be thinking of our organizations more like a salad bowl. 
right? A salad bowl, within the salad bowl, everything gets to maintain its integrity. You want your lettuce to be crispy and crunchy and your craisins to be plump and sweet. Your onions, you're getting my salad recipe right now, right? But we want those different flavors come together to create something new and delicious in every salad mix. Now, I often get asked, what about the organizational culture? Right? Well, that's your salad dressing. And maybe you're a green goddess type of organization. Maybe you're a ranch type of organization, right? <laughs> but you put that salad dressing on top. Um, the melting pot should no longer be our goal. Um, Henry Ford, who is you know a businessman that everyone knows of, there's a Henry Ford Institute, um, he had uh, the American melting pot was his ideal goal. And he actually used to have a melting pot ceremony where people would go into, they would come dressed in the cultural garb of their country. And they would go through this program and he would have them walk into a melting pot representation and walk out the other side in a business suit, signifying that they were American. And so they were stripping people of their culture. Like to become American, you had to give up a part of yourself. And that's not the goal anymore, right? We want to be able to take the power of all of those differences to create something that is special and is new. So there are so many things that we could be talking about today, but we're going to be focused on these two, which is, um, privilege and microaggressions. And I like to describe privilege as having a system that's been designed with you in mind, and microaggressions uphold and reflect the bias that's been built into systems. So let's start off by talking about what privilege is, right? When I say a system designed with you in mind, you, we can think back to the beginning of a lot of different systems, right? Uh, you can think back to the formation of your college. You can think back to the formation of our country as a whole. And who was at the table when those things were being created? When our country was being created, we had uh, wealthy, land-owning, white males that were creating the culture of our country. And they created a place that reflected them, right? Women at that time couldn't vote. Women couldn't own land, right? Uh, black people were thought of as property. And those things were built into our system. Right? Another idea or another example of having a system built with you in mind, um, earlier last year, I was doing a presentation at a place that um, the room that they had me presenting in was on the second floor, right? And so you had the, there were no elevators. You had to walk upstairs to get to that room. As an able-bodied person, I was okay with that. Right, But I thought about that building and that facility, probably built by an able-bodied architect with able-bodied people giving input as to how the building would be designed. Right, And it was built to be a place that was comfortable for someone who uh, did not use adaptive devices. And if a person who used adaptive devices like a wheelchair or walkers came in, they would have a hard time in that place, right? Now, usually, and especially today, because we're having lots of conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we feel like, okay, we want our spaces to be open to everyone. But if you don't have people at the table, if you don't have equal representation at that table that's developing this space, you are bound to leave something out that makes a different group feel comfortable in that space. And that's why representation is so important. Privilege we can define as a set of unearned benefits given to people who fit into a certain social group. And sometimes this is intentional, 
like some of the examples I've given, sometimes it's unintentional, right? And all of those things, you know, can, those different identity markers uh, can be involved in this, whether it's race, class, gender, uh, sexual orientation, right? When we think about uh, the way the education system has been designed, right? It is especially colleges, have been built for people who have a certain amount of economic wealth, right? Whether it is, uh, even if someone can get in through scholarships and other things like that, the way college was designed is not necessarily built for that. So like in my undergrad, I worked really hard. I had three jobs. It was very hard for me to study. I came out with a bunch of debt. I went on to my master's later on in life. I had a kid at that time, was also working full time to get my master's. I completed it because I felt that as a black woman, in order to get ahead in my career, that I needed to have that degree. But you know, now I've got a lot of student loan debt that I'm still, I wonder sometime if I will ever pay it off. Right. And that is because the way the system was designed really is for people who maybe have more financial support. Their parents are helping them to to get through, you know, so even if they do get a scholarship, they've got uh, housing or they're not trying to pay for their car note or, or other things like that. Also, privilege is often invisible to those that have it. Now, when you hear the word privilege, a lot of times people are like, oh, that's not that's not me, right? I'm not privileged because when they think of privilege, they think of someone like this. <laughs> They're like someone with money to burn, someone that looks pompous, right? Someone like this is what I think of when I see someone with privilege. But we have to understand that one, we can have privilege in different parts of our identity. So I am a, a black woman, right? And people might look at me and say, oh, well, she doesn't have a lot of privilege, but I have socioeconomic privilege, right? As I've moved up in my career, uh, I have housing privilege. I was able to buy a house for my family, right? I have education privilege, even though I'll be paying for it the rest of my life, right? There are privileges that I have in certain identities, even though other identities of mine may not have privilege. We also have to understand that having privilege is nothing that disparages uh, the work that you do. Having privilege doesn't mean that you haven't worked hard, right? Let's say you have two students that are studying for a test and they both go to all of the extra practice sessions, they study hard, they both get tutors, and they go in and they take the test and one student gets like an A plus out the moon and another student gets like the other student who studied just as hard gets a bleep b plus or an a minus and what we find out is like the difference between the two students is that the second student is english as a second language and so they studied very hard but when they got to the test they had to translate everything out of English into their native language, think about the answer, write the answer down, right? So it took them a little bit longer, right? Maybe they didn't translate everything perfectly. They still worked very hard to get that grade, but they didn't have the privilege of the test being in their native language. Both students may worked hard. The student that got the A plus deserves the A plus. Right? Even though they had privilege in that the test was in a language that they understood. Having privilege doesn't mean that you didn't work hard and that you don't deserve what you've gotten in life, right? It just means that we have to acknowledge where we might have an extra bit of foothold, where we might have a little bit of extra support. Most of us simultaneously occupy privileged and non-privileged identities, like I just said. And so if you, you know, if someone calls on you to think about your privilege, it doesn't mean that like your whole identity, your whole life is privileged, right? And sometimes we have uh, these things where someone maybe gets told that they have racial privilege, but they're like, I grew up poor, right? I didn't get things handed to me. What do you mean I have privilege? Right? Well, you can have racial privilege, but not have socioeconomic privilege. 
not have sexuality privilege, right? So there is multiple identities within us. Remember the iceberg, right? And we might have certain areas where we have privilege and others where we don't. The other thing we have to realize is that privilege is often invisible to those that have it. Because we think of the ways that life is hard for us, but we don't usually recognize all the ways that we go through life and it's easy for us, right? And so we don't think about those things. I, um, you know, I told you I lived in Colorado. The job that moved me to Colorado, I was vice president of community engagement, education, and inclusion for an invertebrate zoo. Yes, there's inclusion at an invertebrate zoo too, right? And at that site, we had two double doors that people came in and out of all day long. They did not have an automatic door opener. And so if you were a wheelchair user, you would have to either wait for someone in your party to open the doors for you. If you came alone, alone, you'd have to wait for someone on another party to open the doors for you or someone behind the front desk to notice you were sitting outside and come around and open the door for you. We had a volunteer that came three times a week, usually during a time where we didn't have a lot of guests. So they were often sitting outside of the door. They were a wheelchair user that got dropped off by public transportation. They were often sitting outside of that door waiting for someone to open the door for us, for them. They finally brought it to our attention, the leadership team. They were like, you know, this isn't very inclusive. You talk a lot about inclusion. This isn't very inclusive. And so we decided to, uh, that we needed to do something. Like I walked in and out of those doors every day and I hadn't even thought about it, right? It was invisible to me. We then got into a meeting, all the leadership team, no one who had a disability, and we started talking about when we were gonna do this. Then the conversation about budget came up. And we said, well, do we need to do this now or could we wait until the next budget cycle? We had not budgeted for this, right? Because most people don't recognize when they have privilege, we're often unable to recognize when we have a role in keeping other groups subordinate to us. And so we started talking about budget and started talking about putting this off and it took us a few days to come back together and realize how messed up that was. Because if the door had been broken in such a way that able-bodied people couldn't get through it, we never would have had a discussion about budget. We would have had to fix it right then, right? Because we felt like it was really important. When people are saying that they need they, they need inclusion now, when they're saying that they need certain equity things now. And of course, there's always excuses, like the budget was actually an actual excuse, right, that uh, impacted our bottom line. And so we'll always have thoughts of, well, let's wait on it, or we want it on our time without understanding that we have the rights already. Like we have the privilege already, right? And we're saying that someone else can wait to have the same privileges that we do. We also have to realize the dangerous thinking in that, well, the way that I am is normal and the people who are asking for certain rights are different than me, right? And so people who or have dominant identities are seen as the natural identities, right? They're seen as the normal way to be. And if you are outside of that, you're seen as abnormal. So we unconsciously feel like, oh, I'm coming in this space, I'm walking into this space, and of course I have the right to come through this door every day because I don't have a disability. And if you have a disability that is outside of what we consider to be normal, so we get into dangerous thinking about what uh, rights people who are not uh, highly represented deserve within a space, right? 
So when we think about how privilege shows up in the work that we do, I just want to give you some examples of ways that you might see privilege. Um, the first is able privilege. I've talked a lot about able body privilege, right? Another example is just being able to receive information in a way that you understand consistently. I was walking through um, Dulles Airport yesterday and like trying to find baggage claim and I'm so glad that I had the ability to see so I could read all the signs then even though I got turned around to find my way to baggage claim. If you were someone who is blind it would be a much harder space to navigate. Cis privilege. Cis means on the same side as, right? Trans is opposite of. So if you are cisgender, it means that your gender aligns with the sex that you were assigned at birth. If you are trans or non-binary or something in between, it means that you don't, full like, you don't feel like your gender fully aligns with that sex that you were given at birth. So cis privilege, you're less likely to face harassment for using the bathroom that aligns with your gender. Right? And at that same facility that I worked at, we had um, a woman, a cisgender woman, but who dressed and presented masculine, who was always getting yelled at in the bathroom. So she wasn't even transgender. She just had a short haircut, right? And she was always getting yelled at in the bathroom because that's become a very contentious uh, point. Christian privilege, that's just you're less likely to be uh, asked to celebrate holidays from another faith right, than what you believe in. Um, you probably, you know, your office might have a, a Christmas party, right, um, thinking that that's a neutral thing, but you may have people who do not celebrate Christianity, don't believe in that particular uh, story. I have friends who are Jewish who have to take time off of work to celebrate their high holidays, Right? They have to use their vacation time because it's not typically a time that they're given time off. Right? And so we don't really think about that a lot. We just think of those, oh, those are just the holidays, right? Maybe I get Easter off and maybe I don't even celebrate Easter, but it's a day that I get off because it's a holiday, but it's a, a Christian holiday. Class privilege, you're more likely to be able to take a full-time unpaid internship right? Uh, heterosexual straight privilege, the ability to uh, mention who you're married to or dating without trying to think, do I need to say that Chris is actually a woman, right? Or do I just leave it alone and let them make their assumptions? Male privilege, the decision to hire you probably won't be based on whether or not you're going to be having a kid in the near future. I know when I hit like 30 and I was married, uh, I had three job interviews where people asked me, you know, casually, it wasn't casual, like, oh, are you planning on having kids anytime soon, right, in a job interview. White privilege, this is like the oh, white privilege, oh my goodness, right? But white privilege really is the ability to buy products knowing that skin tone or flesh color refers to you. I know when I was a kid, I had a crayon, my crayons had a flesh color crayon it was not my skin color. Even today, like pantyhose and certain things, you say nude. And I was like, that's not the color that I look like when I'm nude, right? But when you have a dominant identity, oftentimes you are represented as the default. And we don't even think about that, right? That may not be something that's ever crossed your mind. Pointing out privilege doesn't mean we want to take privileges away, right? It just means we want to afford everybody the same privileges. So I don't want Leah to have to wear a dark brown Band-Aid, right, when she has a cut. I just want her to have a Band-Aid that's her skin tone and for me to also have a Band-Aid that matches my skin tone, right? So when we talk about being allies in a space of privilege, ally, an ally is a member of a social social group that enjoys some privilege and is working to understand their privilege and to start ending the oppression, the differences between groups who are privileged and not privileged. Acting as an ally is about action. We'd love to have like an allyship badge and say, I'm an ally, right? But actually from moment to moment, your allyship 
can change, right? And if you are act actively in the moment doing something that challenges oppression, challenges privilege, you can call yourself an ally. But if you let that moment pass and you don't, then you are not using your allyship skills and you are not an ally in that moment. For me, that actually takes the pressure off of allyship because we've seen a lot of conversations when someone says, oh, you're not being a good ally and someone's like, that's, that's why nobody likes to help y'all anyway. Like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm an ally, I've always been an ally, right? Because we think of it as a label that if it gets taken away from us, it's a part of our identity. But we need to think of it as actions and also we need to understand that depending on what's most relevant about you in a situation, you might switch between being marginalized or being an ally. So let's say you're a white woman, you're at a meeting, it is predominantly males, and you are saying some suggestions and no one is hearing you. And then someone who is male says the suggestion and everybody hears them, right? You may need an ally in that moment because the most important thing about you is your gender in that moment. You might need an ally to say, hey, Beth, I think I heard Beth say something similar. I would love to hear more about your idea, Beth, right? Let's say you're a white woman and you're in a group and there is a black woman who is not being heard in the group, right? And it then is the race that is the most important thing. And you can use your white privilege to say, hi, Shanika just said something and I'm not sure if everybody heard, Let's can we raise that voice, right? So allyship is a verb, it's action, it's not an identity. And there's actually different levels of allyship so the actor level, a lot of people are at the actor level, don't even realize it. They're like, I know there's a problem. I want it to change. I'm not quite sure what, I, what needs to happen, but I feel like it should change, right? They are a spectator at a game. They are not taking action to make the change, but they realize that there's an issue. We have people at that level who will call themselves an ally even though they're not doing any action to break down a system of oppression. The next level, the allyship level, is folks who realize there's an issue and in situations they're willing to take action. So let's say they're in a group with people who share their dominant identity. Someone says something messed up and they're like, oh, okay, let's hold on a second. I'm not sure if you realize I used to say that same thing or I used to think that same thing, but actually uh, we don't say that any longer. We don't do that any longer. They are disrupting what's happening and they typically disrupt things in uh, situations of their dominant identity, right? They work within spaces with people who share similar privilege that they do. The next level is an accomplice and an accomplice level really is about uh, relationships, really is about taking the cues for what needs to be done to break down a system of oppression from the people who are most impacted by that system. So an accomplice has built deep relationships with people who are affected by issues of oppression and they take from them, what should I be doing, right, to do this? They're not just operating in privileged spaces, but they are backing up in their word, in their action, in what they give their time to people who are actually oppressed. Now, sometimes people hear accomplice and they're like, like, what do you mean? Like an accomplice to a crime? Like, what are we talking about here? And it is very similar because an accomplice is willing to lose something. An ally in a situation, you know, where you have a privileged identity might choose to or choose not to address something. Maybe I address it with my brother, but with me, Ma, oh, she's really, she's old and I don't want people to be mad at me, like I'm attacking me, Ma, so I'm gonna let her say whatever she's gonna say, right? An accomplice is willing to disrupt oppression even when they have something to lose. Even when they're like, my boss might think of me differently. 
My friends might be mad at me. They are willing to lose something. And with people of oppression that are facing oppression, that's very important, right? In order to break down systems of oppression, we have to be willing to lose something because that's what it takes to really push things forward. So again, actor actions are performative. They don't usually challenge the status quo. Ally actions are operating solidarity with, but not necessarily coordinated with people who are in the middle facing the oppression. Accomplice, their actions are coordinated with the people most affected and will disrupt the status quo, even when it's uncomfortable. So I want you to think about the ways that you can be an ally as we move into this next session, section of microaggressions. Because microaggressions, right, we said privilege is having a system built with you in mind. Microaggressions uphold that system, uphold the bias that is in that system, right? When we talk about microaggressions, um, usually it is uh, someone that is saying something or behavioral, say, uh, acting something out that tells someone else that they are different than they expected in the space, that they are um, sometimes not welcomed in the space, right? We see like this particular microaggression with the woman wearing the hijab. You were born in America? Right? So the thought is, I know what an American looks like, or I think I know what an American looks like, and you are different than I expected. So you tell me you were born in America, and I'm questioning that because it is different than I expected. I have a bias about who I think is an American and who is not. Right? So microaggressions uncover those hidden biases. They are brief little verbal, behavioral, or environmental messages. They can be intentional or unintentional. They're often subtle, right? And sometimes very stunning to the people that receive them. They've been described as little insults. My grandma would call it a backwards compliment, right? <laughs> You've probably heard people who um, say, you know, um, I get mad when people tell me I'm so articulate, right? And I've had people say, well, why would someone be mad if you were to say that they're articulate? And, you know, someone broke it down for me one time. They're like, articulation is like about fluency. Like, can you string your words together fluently? <laughs> like, it's not a compliment, right? To, to them, they said, it tells me that they didn't expect me to be able to speak fluently and confidently. If they had told me they liked a certain point about my speech, they had told me that I was very intelligent or whatever, that still might be a microaggression because did you not expect me to be intelligent? <laughs> but, you know, uh, we, have, we say certain things when we are surprised, right? Talking about behavioral messages, we can give microaggressions behaviorally. So I have a friend who's a trans woman, and she talks about when she is in groups of other women, and a new person joins the group, can be another woman, could be a male, um, a lot of times they will give hugs to the women in the group, and when they get to her, they like put out their hand to shake their hand, right? So showing behaviorally, and it's a lot of times unconscious, right? And she told me that, and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And like two weeks later, we uh, were going to a festival, she was there, and my husband came up. And I watched him do this. He went and hugged all the women in the group, women that he, some of them he had met, some of them he had not met. He got to this woman and put his hand out and then like stopped himself. Like I saw the process of him realizing his bias and then leaning in to give her a hug, right? It can be very unintentional and often dismissed as being harmless or innocent. 
Now, throughout my career, I faced a ton of different microaggressions, especially uh, once I got into leadership spaces. I worked for many years in residential environmental learning centers, and my last job before moving to Colorado, I was working actually in Virginia on the Eastern Shore. I was director of education for a field station, a marine science field station. We had 13 member universities from uh, Pennsylvania, actually did not have any from DC, <laughs> but Pennsylvania universities that came to see us on Wallops Island. And I lived on site, taught on site, and worked on site. People often or usually mistaken me for either being housekeeping or someone who worked in the kitchen. I loved Bacon Day on campus because, you know, it made the campus smell so good. I loved that bacon, but I also hated Bacon Day because I knew someone was going to compliment me on my bacon, even though I was not the one who cooked it. Uh, people would often, uh, I would be getting ready to do a speech and would be setting up tables or whatever. People would come in and be like, oh, they got you working so late. I thought housekeeping would have been gone by now. I wanted someone to commiserate with, so, you know, I've always of the mind that you don't complain down or even laterally, right, but you can talk to um, your superiors just to commiserate about what's going on. And when I talked to my superior, she said, uh, well, surely that doesn't have anything to do with race. Right? I think she didn't want it to have to do with race. She said, if I was out and about on campus, I'm sure people would say the same things to me. Right? And so she had a certain thought, and I think she really didn't want it to be about race, but that dismissal kind of uh, hindered me. Like I then internalized a lot of things. And microaggressions um, can really uh, affect us. Right? Um, microaggressions can affect us in our personal lives, our work life, and in our community. Because of timing, we won't do our group chat, but I do encourage you to talk to your colleagues, talk to the people that you work with, because you may not know the microaggressions that they're facing. I did work for a university in Colorado, uh, Colorado State University, for a while, and their equity office actually had a microaggression reporting uh, sheet. And so people could give anonymous feedback about microaggressions that they had received. And the equity office would use that to then decide uh, what areas we needed to be doing more education in. If they got similar microaggressions uh, about the same person, they might have a conversation with that person or alert, or alert that person's superior so they could have a conversation with them. But they were very uh, emphatic that it was not a punitive thing. It was about education. And it was about letting people know, because they often are unintentional, People just don't understand, and because they don't understand the impact that they are making, they also are not able to repair relationships, right? Um, also, one last story about a microaggression that actually years later I, I can laugh about. Uh, my second week on the job as a vice president, uh, we were doing planning for a big community event, and the vice president of marketing said, okay, y'all better be ready because I am going to pimp y'all out. Yeah, I'm gonna pimp y'all out. And like we were around this table with like directors, vice presidents, um, and I was the only uh, person of color in the meeting and everybody stopped and looked at me. And I'm not sure if the microaggression was that she said it or that everybody stopped and looked at me, but <laughs> they did. And um, she, she got flustered. And she said, oh, no, no, no. I mean, like, I'm going to pimp y'all out like Snoop Dogg, right? She made it worse. <laughs> like Snoop Dogg. And uh, everybody looked at me again. And I was like, sounds like we're going to be working hard. <laughs> like, and then she came in my office the next day 
tears, this crying, and wanted to assure me that, you know, she wasn't racist and she was so sorry and this and that. And, you know, um, I'm glad that she came to talk to me, but the apology put the onus on me to um, make her feel better, right? Uh, there was no room for me to talk about how the situation made me feel. I had to comfort her for an hour. Uh, she stayed in my office to talk about this. So just, just a thought, right? So we do want to talk about microaggressions because they have harmful impacts. They've been shown to increase stress in the lives of people that receive them. Um, they deny or negate racialized experiences like my superior uh, did. I started to have a crisis of self when I thought about my career and the microaggressions I'd received. I wondered if anyone would make me an executive director or would put me in charge of an organization if all they saw was someone who worked in the kitchen or someone who was housekeeping. Would anyone ever think of me differently? And it almost affected my career path because I felt so bad about it. So we have to think about and address microaggressions. We can't just let them lie, even though it is very tempting because we have been taught that we don't address things, you know, we don't want to make it uncomfortable. So we just don't talk about it, right? Usually the person, if they are talked about, a lot of times the person who uh, is told feels like the victim has overreacted. I think that on the other side, we don't want to talk about things that are uncomfortable, but we also don't want to feel like we've hurt someone. So we'd rather deny it or say that they were too sensitive than to deal with, oh, these words actually may have had actions, uh, had a negative impact. And so we have to realize as beings that we're not perfect. We make mistakes and we've been socialized into a society that like teaches us microaggressions. You know, we're told from a young age, like we make jokes, like I grew up with your mama jokes, right? That were often about people being poor, people being uneducated, all of these things. Like we are taught those things. We are taught these biases. And I always tell people it is not your fault the biases that you continue to be taught and that you were raised on. What is within our control is the actions that we do, the words that we say, right? And in order to think differently, we have to be exposed to different things and be willing to address the ways that we have been uh, programmed. It's okay to make mistakes. We just have to be open and honest about those vulnerabilities right? And it starts with creating a culture where you can have open conversations and where you can make mistakes. A lot of conversations that I'm having now with some of the organizations that I, I work with is how, what does repair look like after someone has said the wrong thing, after someone has made a mistake and messed up, how do we repair that? How do we make whole the person that was offended? But how do we provide a path for redemption, right? To help people get back so that it's not so scary to mess up. When people mess up, we think about cancel culture. We think about other things. We feel like, oh, this is like, <laughs> You know, um, this is going to be the end of me. But things like cancel culture come from a, a generation, a society that has not had a voice and whose voice is not being taken seriously and who's not had an effective way to combat things. Social media is changing everything, right? Because we're more connected than ever. And now it's like boycotting on a major scale because we have that connectivity. So we have to create a culture of learning and coming back from when we make mistakes so people feel safe enough to be able to make those mistakes. In my organization, the tech startup, we do something called Ouch Oops, where if someone says something inappropriate, the person who recognizes it as a microaggression or inappropriate says, ouch. The person who's speaking says, oops. 
and then we stop and we make time to talk about it, right? So in a staff meeting uh, a couple of months ago, someone used the term low man on the totem pole. It got ouch, oops. Half the group didn't even, they're like, what, is that a bad thing, right? So other people didn't know. We spent five minutes, we were on a Zoom call, we like Googled it and talked about it, right? And we had a learning moment. And because we've done it long enough, we realized I might get ouch oops today, but next week is gonna be your time, right? And so everyone makes mistakes and we can learn together. So to wrap up, I want to talk to you a little bit about what does it look like to have a difficult conversation, right? What does it look like to talk about this in real time? And while it is best to be able to set up the culture beforehand so people know it, so like at the beginning of a class, right? Or at the beginning of a retreat or you know, whatever, like, hey, this is our technique for having difficult conversations so people know. Sometimes that's not possible, right? So what do we do in real time when something's coming up? We're gonna go through just a few skills for dealing with this. And um, I'm gonna use an example. Uh, let's say you're at the school softball game I don't know, do y'all have softball games? You're at the school softball game, and um, Jim says to Tim, come on, Tim, you're throwing like a girl, right? Uh, how do we address that? So first we start with inquiry, right? We want to have curious inquiry rather than trying to humiliate or shame the person. We're not trying for a gotcha moment, right? We're trying rather to learn together. So we ask the person, hey, what, what did you mean by that? Hey, Jim, I heard you use this <laughs> uh, term with uh, Tim, and I'm just wondering, can you tell me a little bit more about what you meant by that, right? I'm curious, what made you say that? What makes you believe that? Why did you ask that? So on and so forth. Just curious inquiry. Then we want to paraphrase or reflect, and this is really important because one of the biggest things when we're talking about microaggressions is intent versus impact. And a lot of people understand what, what they feel like their intent was, and it is hard for them to get past that unless they feel like you understand too. And so we start off by asking them, what their intention was, what they meant. Then we reflect that, we paraphrase that. Oh, you're saying that Tim is usually our best player. Today he's off, you're very frustrated by that. And so you said this particular term, right? So I'm, I'm getting where you're coming from. I'm hearing what you're saying. Next is reframe, right? And so, and when I'm reframing things, I often like to use myself as an example, but reframing means that you're trying to get that person to think differently, right? And so, hey, yeah, yeah, you know, I used to use that statement all the time. I used to say, you throw like a girl, and I didn't think anything of it, but someone at one point pointed out to me that what I was actually saying, like, we have a lot of really good women players, on this team and saying something like that, right, would be disparaging them. I also learned that it's actually, you know, it's kind of harmful because it's like questioning Tim's masculinity. Like that is like the threat, that's the joke. You know, you are, I'm going to compare you to a woman, right, because I feel like you are not doing well today. And I realized that that actually wasn't what I wanted to be saying, right? And so I changed my thinking around that. It's really important to use impact and I statements. We want to talk about either the impact that it had or how you felt about it. Um, we don't want to address something on behalf of someone else. So I wouldn't go up and say, whoa, 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 wait, you're making Tim feel bad right? Because maybe Tim didn't feel bad, right? Maybe Tim didn't care, but we're addressing it not for Tim, but for someone else who might come 
and be offended by that. Because microaggressions usually, um, when they really affect someone, it is because it's built up over time. If one person had assumed that I was housekeeping at the job that I worked, I might have been a little miffed. Be like, no, I'm the boss, right? But it wouldn't have demoralized me. But the fact that once or twice a week, every week, during my seven years at that job, someone made that assumption, right? It really affected me. And so the person may not be affected right away, but the person who hears it for the 50th time might. So when we are addressing something, we don't address it for them, but we address it for the future, and we address what we see. So it's important to say, hey, I noticed this, and I was thinking this. Another example, um, I was once on a board where, again, I was the only uh, person of color, and it was during uh, 2020. We all know what was happening in 2020. Um, and after the death of George Floyd, this board, all white except for me, wanted to do a Black Lives Matter statement. They asked me if I would help craft it, and I was like, ah, I'm a little too raw. I don't think that I can do this right now. And so they got together a committee to build it up. They wrote it out. They brought it to the board meeting. They said this statement, and all hell broke loose <laughs> because there were people on the board who were not educated, not aware, and they were like, oh, I don't, what is this, like, anti-blackness? We don't have anti-blackness, and, you know, I don't even know if I can't really can jive with the statement of black lives matter, like, I think all lives matter, and, like, on and on and on the conversation went. And I was quiet, but there were many things that were being stated that were either outright racist or ignorant, Someone in the group trying to be an ally said, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I think we're making Parker feel uncomfortable. It then turned the situation to me. Parker, are you feeling uncomfortable? Well, Parker needs to speak up if she's not feeling comfortable, blah, blah, blah. Did not address the microaggressions and the racist things that were being said. And so that's another reason why you don't want to turn it on the person who is possibly being offended, because then it becomes about whether or not that person was offended and not about the thing that was said that was wrong. Um, next is preference points. Sometimes you have that conversation and Jim isn't like, oh, I've never thought of it that way. Jim is like, I'm not doing whatever, whatever, and you're being too sensitive. Well, if you already have things set up within your organization, like uh, uh, the conduct that you do in your organization, your anti-racism, whatever policy is, you can say, oh, okay, I understand that you might not agree with all of this, and I just wanted to share some of my insights, but I do want to tell you that this particular thing that you've said or way that you're acting within our space we just don't allow it, right? And so I know you might do whatever you want to do in your personal life, but just for here, please do not do that, right? So you can state your preference statement. Let's say they are getting with it, right? They're like, yeah, no, I never ever thought of it that way, right? Then you can like get into it, use strategic questions like, oh, what might be, what could we say differently, right? How might we, um, what's, you know, like get into the conversation with them. How could we examine our biases in the future? So on and so forth. Last but not least, don't be afraid to revisit things. Sometimes someone says something and we're too stunned in the moment, right? We're like, someone says it, we're like, did anyone else hear that, right? Is that like, is someone else gonna say something? Like, that was messed up, right? But we let the moment pass and then we're like, oh, we can't, well, we can't say anything now. We didn't say it fast enough. Don't be afraid to go back, right? You can say, hey, you know, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry, y'all. Yeah, I'm going to be that person. Someone said something like 10 minutes ago, and I wasn't, I, I had to take a moment to process it. 
but could we just talk real quick? You know, um, because I know we've said this is a learning space, and I just think it would be good to talk about it. Or at your next meeting, hey, something was said at the last meeting, and I just think it'd be great for us to address it for all of our learning, whatever, whatever. It is very important to address microaggressions because unaddressed microaggressions are just as impactful and harmful as the microaggression itself. Because people are looking around, right? You might be as an ally, like, did anyone hear that? Right? But most likely, the person who would have been the subject of that microaggression definitely heard it. And because everyone is silent, they feel like, oh, everyone must believe the same thing, think the same way. And that's why no one said anything, right? And so we have to be willing to address microaggressions that happen. We have to be willing to say things like, hey, you know, you're really passionate about that. Can you tell me more? Um, what makes you ask that question? Hey, I would, what you said, you know, really made me think a little bit. Can we talk more about that? We have to be willing to address things, right? And, you know, you can do it in your own way. I was listening to someone talk about being on a date for the first time, and uh, the person they were with was telling a very offensive story. They had come out of a space, they bumped into an Asian family, and they were telling a very offensive story uh, with lots of bias and racism. And uh, she stopped them, she said, oh, oh, I hope you aren't telling me this because you think that I agree with that. Right? And she did it in her own way. She's a really peppy person. And she's like, oh, 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 let me stop you. You know, like very sweet. And so you can do it in your own way, whatever is authentic for your personality. But make time to talk about microaggressions. Make time to debrief with your teams, to be willing to, to step up as an ally into this space. Because remember, Silence in the face of injustice kills space for productive conversations. So I hope that you all, you know, kind of, if you all are doing such amazing work, it was wonderful to hear everything. And I hope that you take time to think about what can you be doing as an ally in your daily life here on campus to break down and combat uh, microaggressions, because that is how you start to create those spaces that are inclusive, those spaces that are welcoming of everyone. That's how you begin to create your salad bowl. So I want to thank you all for having me uh, here today. It's been a pleasure.